Let's talk about my funeral for a minute. Now, I'm not dying of anything yet. Nothing that I know of anyway. I mean, I have the usual aches and pains. But otherwise, I seem to be in pretty good health. And unless my brothers here are putting arsenic in my oatmeal, I fully expect to enjoy another 40, 50 years of life, God willing, God willing. But just in case something is going to happen, I want to cover some details beforehand. Now, first, brothers and sisters, you have heard it said that funerals are for the living and not for the dead. But I tell you that this is, to borrow a technical theological term, nonsense. Yes, it is true that funerals are there for the consolation of the family and friends of the deceased. And those who attend are hoping for some closure and for a sign of hope and comfort. And we must be there for them. That is a kindness and a charity that we owe them. But although we say that they are for the living, ironically, they really seem to have become less and less for the living. Instead of allowing people to mourn, we do what we call a celebration of life. And we priests will often wear white as a sign of the hope for resurrection. Now, hope is a good thing. The idea for me is a good thing. Doesn't it strike you as odd that everyone who comes to a funeral would wear black while only the priest would wear white? It's almost as if the entire funeral is about saying, don't mourn, don't cry. He or she is already in heaven. Well, folks, for my funeral anyway, the priests are going to wear black. I guess it might sound kind of selfish, but I want at least some people crying for me, some people sad that I'm gone, some people praying for me, not celebrating my life and forgetting about me down there in purgatory, with me saying, little help. <laughs> now, I say that half-jokingly, but the point is this, that funerals, that the holy sacrifice of any Mass is truly just as much, if not more sometimes, for the dead. What was implicit in the new ordination rite for priests was stated explicitly in the older rite. When the bishop told the newly ordained priest, receive the power to offer sacrifice to God and to celebrate Mass, both for the living and the dead, in the name of the Lord. Now, I and all the priests here take that obligation very seriously, and you can be sure that we fulfill it to the best of our abilities, but most of all, on this holy day, for all your loved ones. So let us move then to the subject of our celebration, all these souls we pray for, the holy souls of the dearly departed, now, today, many view purgatory as kind of an outdated idea, or perhaps a little macabre, as somehow being a cruel punishment from God for unworthy souls. And if you've ever seen some of the old holy cards of the souls in purgatory, you might understand what I'm talking about. And so I left some out there at the entrances. And if you didn't pick one up, you can pick one up on your way out and take a look at it and figure out what is the art here trying to tell us. Well, in this piece of art, the soul is depicted as an almost naked woman in chains, in jail cell as flames rise up around her with her hands lifted up to God. Well, is this what it seems? Well, first of all, why a woman? Well, the word for soul in Latin, anima, is grammatically feminine. And so we would depict generally all souls, even if they rise out of a man's body as feminine in traditional Catholic art. But what about the flames? In the first reading, 
we hear the beautiful words from wisdom, where the souls are purged from their impurities, where they are purified as fire tried gold. And after this process of purification, we see that God, quote, found them worthy of himself, and as a sacrificial offering, he took them to himself. Now this describes a process that can be, spiritually speaking, difficult or painful. After all, we are being rid and purged from a lifetime of sin, of vices, of failures to love as we should, of attachments that we have a hard time letting go of. In the funeral mass, the church prays that for those who believe in God, life is changed, not ended. We undergo that arduous process of change, of being born into new life in a similar manner as the unborn child in his mother's womb undergoes his change to new life. Nevertheless, in spite of all this, holy souls are depicted as joyful. Yes, I said, joyful. More joyful than we can begin to imagine here on earth. The poet Dante paints a beautiful picture of the holy souls arriving at the gate of purgatory, singing a psalm of deliverance in utter joy. Now, how can they be joyful if they know that this process of purgation awaits? If this is what's waiting for them, it is because first and foremost, they have hope, true hope, not like we have hope. In this earth, we say we have faith, hope, and love. But here on earth, we rely so much on faith, and that faith is at time tenuous and difficult to grasp. In purgatory, what happens? Well, faith fades away. There is no longer any need for faith because we know we are almost there. God is waiting for us as sure as I stand here before you today. Their victory is certain and so their hope is pure and unadulterated by any doubt. And as St. Paul says today most fittingly, hope does not disappoint. These souls are like runners who, while every muscle may ache, seeing the finish line is at hand, they race all the harder, knowing that all their aches and pains shall be but faint memory when they win that glorious crown of victory. Our holy soul in, in our picture is as a runner, reaching for that final finish line. If we could only but have a share in the hope that the holy souls have, we too would do anything to arrive at heaven's gate. And when the holy souls finally behold God with their own eyes, even hope fades away in heaven, for there will no longer be any need for hope, because love and only love will remain. And we shall be justified by him, and the now just souls will be in the sure hands of God forever and ever. But for us here then, even though we may be a little farther from God than the holy souls, we can still help them. In Maccabees, we hear of a sacrifice offered for the sins of the fallen warriors of Israel who had unfortunately died in grave sin. And it is called a good, holy, and pious thing that the leader of the warriors offered a sacrifice for their souls. We number this, the praying, offering sacrifice for the souls among the spiritual works of mercy. Praying for the dead is good and efficacious. As giving the thirsty runner a cool drink to slake their thirst, so do our prayers and sacrifices done in love help the faithful departed slake their thirst as they reach for the living God. We give them, if you will, a little push from behind, 
urging them ever upward and onward to the final finish. So, brothers and sisters, if I happen to pass to my eternal reward before you do, well, mourn for me, or I guess you can celebrate my life. Do as you wish. But do not fail to pray for me, a sinner in need of God's mercy. And if and when I am made worthy to stand before God, I will await you at the finish line at heaven's gate, pulling you forward with my own prayers, where we shall together with all the saints sing our own song of joyful deliverance. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints. And yes, blessed be he, even so in his holy souls. Amen.